I am thrilled to be here today. Hello, Pastor Chad. He's out there somewhere. You can give him a hard time later. Today, we continue in our sermon series, Upside Down. In this sermon series, Upside Down, we're really hitting the topics of relationships, of character, and of faith. The Sermon on the Mount is found in Matthew chapter 5, and it is the longest sermon recorded in Scripture. If you think sometimes we go a long time, uh, Jesus went for a very long time in teaching the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus speaks about anger, he speaks about forgiveness, he speaks about lust, he speaks about character, he speaks about faith, he speaks about a lot of the issues and challenges that are applicable and that face us today. 2,000 years later. Why? Because it's all about relationships. It's all about relationships with God. It's about relationships with people. It's about our character, and it's about what we really believe as followers of Christ. So it's applicable, and it matters today. And I want to challenge you in this. As we go through this sermon series, make Matthew chapter 5, the Sermon on the Mount, your daily reading if you, if you, if you don't have anywhere that you're reading right now. Read through the Sermon on the Mount over and over again. I really believe that the Sermon on the Mount has the potential to radically turn your world upside down if you follow the teachings of Jesus in this passage. So the sermon can be found on page 963. If you are at our McCulloch campus right now, or if you're here at Sweetwater, there's a Bible located underneath the seat in front of you. We want to encourage you to take that Bible, use that Bible, read that Bible. If you are in Parker, uh, Parker campus, we want to say there is a table in the back of the room. Go now, get up, go grab a Bible if you don't have one. And, and Parker campus, by the way, we are genuinely excited about what God is doing there. We saw six baptisms over Easter weekend. We had two professions of the faith, uh, faith last weekend. Those are scheduled to be baptized very soon. Just an incredible thing. So let's put our hands together and praise God for what he's doing on the Parker campus. We're excited about what God is doing there. Our main passage of scripture is found in Matthew chapter 5, verse 17 through 20 for today. Jesus said this, do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all is accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of the least of these commandments and teaches others to do the same will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is an interesting passage of scripture. Remember that Jesus was being accused by the Pharisees as a rebel, as a lawbreaker, and now Jesus is standing in front of them teaching the Sermon on the Mount, and he is saying to them, hey, look, all of Old Testament law is important. All of it matters. Verse 19, as you see, is the kind of the origin of what I would call the Bible thumper or the Bible screamer. My wife had taken my daughters into downtown Nashville. They were visiting with family, and they were going down through the touristy spot, Broadway, I think it's Broadway, and they're going through the touristy spot, and a street preacher chooses to call my wife out and was yelling at her, saying, what kind of mother do you think you are bringing your children down to this spot? Well, why would he say such a thing? Because there were tattoo shops and there was, there was alcohol, there was a food being served. But his attitude was he didn't want to relax what God's word taught. And he felt like this was his way of being right with God. Uh, he was wrong, by the way. And then my wife punched him in the nose. I'm just kidding. She kicked him. Now, now look carefully at what Jesus said about, about the Old Testament. Okay, so look carefully back at that. He said, I am not here to do away with the law. He said, not the smallest part of the Old Testament will pass away until it's accomplished. Those who relax these laws are the least in the kingdom of heaven. And those who teach and do them are great. Jesus' teaching on the Old Testament should lead us to the question, are we as followers of Jesus today 
to obey the Old Testament and the New Testament. So be careful if your answer is yes. If your answer is yes, the Old Testament has 613 commandments. And if we are not to relax those commandments, that means we are under this burden to fulfill and to meet and to obey every one of those commands. If we are to relax them but to do them, it also raises some potential conflicts in our lives. For instance, Exodus 21.7 says, When a man sells his daughter as a slave... So the question is, how much am I supposed to sell my daughter to slavery for? Right? So th there's a question there. Uh, or raise your hand if you've ever worked on the Sabbath. Anybody here ever worked on the Sabbath? Okay. Well, the Bible says we are to stone you to death. Right? <laughs> Anybody without sin among you, cast the first stone, right? Uh, or what do we do with those of us who have hair on our face? Do you know that there's an Old Testament law in, Levit in, uh, where is that? in Leviticus 19.27 that says, do not trim off the hair on your temples or trim your beards. So guys, let's see those hairy temples. Does everybody here raise your hand if you trim your hair around your temples? Raise your hand if you've ever had a beard and you trimmed it. So you are to be stoned. Jesus said, and, that's, and Jesus said, look, Anyone who relaxes the least of these commands is the least in the kingdom of heaven. So are we to interpret his teachings in such a way that we are bound by the Old Testament? Can we still play football if we wear gloves? We're not supposed to touch the dead skin of a pig. What is a football made of? Pig skin. So are we allowed to touch a football? right uh what does god consider worse is it most detestable in the eyes of the lord to eat shrimp or to practice homosexuality because the bible teaches us that both of those are detestable so the that's the that's that's the questions or those are the questions that really make the point so if jesus says we are not to relax the least of these commandments yet we as followers of jesus aren't obeying those commandments are we guilty of picking and choosing what we will obey and what we won't obey? How many of you obey all 613 commands of the Bible? Raise your hand. There are 1,050 commands in the New Testament. How many of you obey every single one of those? So are we guilty of picking and choosing, selectively obeying what we want to obey, or is there more to this? So in this passage, Jesus taught everything is to be obeyed, nobody is to relax them. And so in light of Jesus' words, we must understand the Old Testament better. Now, the laws of the Old Testament can really be broken down into three categories. They're, it's not in your notes, but you can write them down. They're broken down into three categories, civil ceremonial and moral now the civil laws were the laws that governed the nation of israel uh, they determined how the israelite nation should be run they were national laws the citizens of israel were expected to obey those laws if they broke the law they were punished so does jesus expect us here in the united states of america to obey the national laws of israel the answer is no you're not jewish right? You're not an Israelite. You're not expected to obey the laws of the good. You're, you are expected to obey the laws of the good old United States of America. Now let's look at the ceremonial laws. These are the laws about washing your hands, purifying your body, uh, getting right with God. It was all about the sacrificial, uh, the sacrificial ceremonial things that people would do to present themselves to God as a, uh, to present themselves as a holy God. Uh, they showed the world that they belonged to God because of their obedience to the these ceremonial laws so does god expect you and i to follow these ceremonial laws today the answer is no why again i'm not an israelite you're not a, you are not an israelite and the way to get right with god is not through ceremonial hand washing the way to get right with god is through Jesus, he's the one who cleanses us. He's the one who washes us. He's the one who forgives us and redeems us. And so we are not now no longer bound by those ceremonial laws. And then the third category is the moral laws. These are the laws that are rooted in God's holiness, in his nature. For instance, we just walked through a sermon series called Guardrails in which we looked at the... Yeah. 
Ten Commandments. And we talked about how God has those to bless us and protect us. That's the whole point of the Ten Commandments, are to bless us and to protect us. They speak to justice, respect, sexual conduct, uh, relationship with God, relationship with others. And does Jesus expect us to follow these moral commands? Yes. So you've already got it. The sermon's over. You have a good night. God bless you. So, yes, and, and in fact, the New Testament commands, one could argue that all 1,050 of the commands found in the New Testament are solely built off of the moral commands that are located and found in the Old Testament. But it's in a different way. It's no longer by trying to live them out according to the flesh, but it's by living them out according to the Spirit. The moral commands were about relationships. If kept correctly, we would have a right relationship with God and we would have a right relationship with other people. Uh, but we don't keep those, do we? We break those moral laws, those moral commands all the time. We, uh, if we don't lie, we think about lying. If we don't do acts of evil towards somebody, we think about it. We might take revenge. We might be bitter. We might be angry with people. And in our anger, we sin against them. So we break these moral commands all the time. We lie, we hurt, we cheat, we steal, and left up to ourselves, our relationship with God also stinks pretty much too. So we fail in keeping a good relationship with others, meaning everybody, and we fail big time when it comes to our relationship with God too. So can we keep all the commands perfectly? No. So are you guilty of relaxing those commandments in your life? We are. That's, if, if there's going to be a guilt point, that's what we're guilty of. Even tonight in this sermon as I'm speaking, I'm like, I hated preparing for this message because it sounds like I'm going against what Jesus just taught. It sounds like Jesus is saying not one iota is going to pass away until all's accomplished. And the person who relaxes even the least of these and teaches others to do the same is going to be least in the kingdom of heaven. And so even as I've been preparing, I'm like, Lord, just call me least. You know, I, I'm the least in the kingdom of heaven, but I'm in good company. And we'll talk about that in a, late, a little bit later on. So can we keep all the commands perfectly? The answer is no, but Jesus did. Jesus kept all the commands because you and I could not. See, we could not keep every one of the commands. He obeyed all the commands not to prove that he was God. He didn't all, obey all the commands to prove that he could do it. Jesus obeyed all the commands so that you and I could be set free from every dot and every iota of the Old Testament covenant. When Jesus cried out on the cross, he cried out three words, and the three words that he cried out on the cross were, it is, it is finished. As he was dying on the cross, he was referring to the fact that the Old Testament law that only highlighted our sinfulness and pointed out to us that we are sinners and pointed out to us that we needed a Savior, as he was dying on the cross, he was pointing out that all of the Old Testament law had been erased that it was finished, meaning it had been fulfilled. Colossians 2.14, Paul wrote this, and he said, He canceled, speaking about Jesus, He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. He's speaking about the law. He's speaking about the Old Testament. He's speaking about the laws of the prophets, that what Jesus did for us on the cross, He nailed that law to the cross. Ephesians 2, Paul wrote again, he said, For Christ himself has brought peace to us. He did this by ending the system of law with its commandments and regulations. As Jesus died on the cross, he yelled out, It is finished, not just because of the physical death that he was, as he was passing the punishment, the torment, carrying the weight of that, but that the law was now finished. The Old Testament regulations, the system of the law, the requirements was finished. It means that you and I are no longer under the obligation to fulfill the law at all, that Jesus ended that old system. He ended that old covenant. 
So if you are trying to earn, earn God's forgiveness, if you are trying to get yourself right with God by keeping obedience to the old promises, you're guilty of believing that the death of Jesus was insufficient way to make you right with God. If you are so works-based, if you are saying, uh, you look at the Ten Commandments and you say about them, well, the Bible says that you should not have a tattoo or you'll be stoned to death, and you teach and preach that to others, you're putting yourself under the system of the law, which Jesus eliminated for us, which Jesus got rid of. He dealt with it. Why? Because we can't be made perfect by the law. But... We can be made perfect by faith. See, if you're a legalist, if you're a rule follower, if you live in fear that you must seek to be perfect in everything you do, if you're under this, this idea that God is never happy with you, that God is never pleased with you, that everything you do fails to meet what God wants, I want you to know something. You were saved failing to meet what God expected of your life. You, you placed your faith in Jesus as a failure, as a sinner, and as a born-again believer in Jesus, you're still not going to be able to fulfill all the commands that God has for us in our lives. That's what grace is. That's what grace is in Jesus. We are insufficient, but Jesus is more than sufficient to cleanse the world from sin and not just you. So I want you to hear this very simply. You are guilty of obeying the law that Jesus ended if you're putting, if you're, if you're putting regulations down from the Old Testament on other people. So stop obeying the law. <laughs> it's that simple. Stop obeying the law. In light of what Jesus said, that anybody who relaxes the law in any way would be least, it sounds like I'm teaching the exact opposite of what Jesus said. But since a lightning bolt has not come down from heaven yet, I feel okay and I want to continue. Uh, am I really about to teach the opposite of what Jesus said about the law? Well, look at what Paul said in Galatians 3.25. He said, now that the way of faith has come, we no longer need the law as our guardian. Paul was transformed by Jesus as he was walking on that road to Damascus on his way to uh, murder and consent to approve as a terrorist uh, to terrorize Christians, Jesus showed up and changed his life. And now, years later, Paul was saying, I was a Pharisee of the Pharisees. Nobody knew the law like I knew the law. And guess what? Because faith has come, I no longer need the law as guardian of my life. What the law is necessary and helpful to do now, the law demonstrates to us that we are sinners. That's why we continue to need the law. That's why the law has not yet passed away. Because the world that has not yet become a follower of Jesus Christ can only find out that they're a sinner based upon God's word, based upon the law. So the law is still in effect for those who are not yet saved. The law is still condemning them, but it's the way of faith that sets us free from the law. You following that? Okay, it's good stuff. Now, as followers of Jesus, we no longer need the law. As followers of Jesus, Paul writes that we've been released from it. In Romans 7, 6, he says, Now we have been released from the law, for we died to it, and we are no longer captive to its power. Now we can serve God, not in the old way of obeying the letter of the law, but in the new way of living in the Spirit. Now this is where joy comes in. This is where hope and grace come in. This is where we as followers of Jesus get to serve God, not out of obligation that we're living in fear of him, but because he has changed our hearts. He's forgiven us. He has set us free. He's given us faith. And now we have something in our hearts called the spirit of God that yearns in us with joy to do what God wants us to do. We get to serve, we get to love, we get to teach, and we get to help, and we get to love God because of what God has done in our hearts. We get to, there's a great joy that accompanies that. I can guarantee you those Pharisees, those Sadducees, those religious leaders that Jesus encountered were not men and women filled with joy. <laughs> 
They didn't like what Jesus was doing. They didn't like the fact that he was healing on the Sabbath. They didn't like the fact that he was eating with drunks and, and tax collectors and that he was uh, hanging out and ministering to prostitutes. They thought he was the worst sinner in the world. And I can guarantee you that they didn't have much joy in their lives either. So we're no longer uh, bound to the law. And if you've become a follower of Jesus, you are not supposed to obey the Old Testament law. But look again at Romans 7, 6. We are to live in the Spirit. There's a new way, what Paul wrote. The new way is to live in the Spirit. So what does it mean to live in the Spirit? Well, simply put, we simply need to start obeying Jesus. That, that's what Jesus has done now for us. He set us free, and because we call him Lord, which means he's the boss of our lives, that he is the one in authority over our lives, that means he gets to tell us what to do. So we stop obeying the law, and now we start obeying Jesus. Jesus said in John 14, 21, He who has my commands and keeps them, that's the one that loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and my Father will love him and show himself to him. If you want to grow in your relationship with God, if you want to experience God's presence, if you want to experience God's love, then start obeying Jesus. It's that simple. Jesus said there's a cycle right there in John 14, 21. The person that loves me, he, he obeys my commands. And if he obeys my commands, my Father loves him and shows himself to him. Raise your hand if you want to experience God's presence in your life more. Start obeying Jesus. Start obeying Jesus. Start living by the Spirit. Start following Him. See, that's what it means when we say that we're a follower of Jesus. It means He's over our lives completely. And think about this. Before His death, at the Last Supper, Jesus took that cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. See, the new covenant, the new covenant is what we are now under. This is a new covenant that God has with his people, not no longer the Old Testament, but now a new covenant that we get to, by faith, live in the Spirit. Jesus' death and resurrection fulfilled the old covenant of works, and it established a new covenant of faith. Now, now I, I mentioned this briefly. Let's think through this. The New Testament, the New Testament has 1,050 commandments. 1,050 commands. And we can find in those commands what it means to live by the Spirit. And if we were going to sum up the 613 Old Testament commands and add those to the 1,050, we would have a lot of commands to obey. And a man who, who was a, a follower of Jesus, or at least interested in the teachings of Jesus, came up to Jesus and he asked him, Jesus, what command is the greatest? He was referring to the Old Testament. He didn't know he was living in the New Testament. He was referring to the Old Testament. He said, hey, Jesus, what command is the greatest? And Jesus summed up not only the 613 Old Testament commands, but then the new 1,050 commands that were going to come. He summed them all up together in Matthew 22. And he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And a second, second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I am not encouraging you to not find out what the other 1,448 uh, verses are, whatever. I, I'm not encouraging you to, to not find those out, but I am telling you Jesus summed it all up there. Jesus summed up what it means to live in the Spirit right here. So instead of judging people for not going to church, instead of judging people who never trim their beards, instead of judging people with, uh, with tattoos or have fallen into sin in some way, we simply love them unconditionally because that's no longer a sin, right? Trimming hair and tattoos, that doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And yet the old street preacher that was yelling at my wife couldn't get past the quote, 
immorality and lawlessness that was all around him and couldn't understand why my wife would expose my children to that type of life. That's somebody that doesn't understand what faith is. That's somebody that doesn't understand what grace is and it's somebody that doesn't understand what the greatest command is to love God and to love our neighbor as ourselves. You know, when we talk about the 22 baptisms at Easter this past week, uh, I'm sorry, when we talk about the 22 baptisms uh, that we experienced over Easter weekend two weeks ago, uh, why did something like that happen? It's because we at Calvary believe that our mission is to lead people into a life-changing relationship with Jesus Christ through the love of his people and the power of his truth. We believe that God's word changes and we believe that God has called us changed people to love people. So we love others and we accept them without judgment. We just let God do the work in their heart. Get out of the way and love people and serve them where they are. Let me ask you a question. If you are a follower of Jesus, are you living in the spirit by loving others as you love yourself? Do you genuinely love people? Is there that joy in your heart? And you know how you can tell that practically? You ever been cut off in a grocery store line? It happened to me this past week. I got so mad because, you know, I'm like giving people time if they want to go. Just got my little shopping cart and I'm about to turn. And as I'm turning, I made the clear turn into the lane. Okay? <laughs> made the clear turn. <laughs> and they just pushed right in front of me. And I was, you know, really, and I think the reason why I was upset about it is because it, they were treating me like I was insignificant. So how do you respond when people treat you as though you're insignificant? Do you love them as you ought to? We need to because that's where grace abounds. You know, that's where grace abounds. Where sin abounds, grace abounds even more. And God desires to use you to shine the light and the love of Jesus in those dark places when you feel insignificant, when you sense that people don't care about you, you care about them anyway, because that's exactly what Jesus did. Romans 5a, God demonstrates his love toward us in this. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet shoving Jesus out of the line, Christ died for us. And that's the way that we need to respond to a broken, hurting world around us. We need to demonstrate that we are under this new covenant that Christ has given to us, that we've been changed by the blood of Christ. We have changed, we're living in the Spirit, and we must love others in practical ways. Romans 13, 10 tells us this, Love does no wrong to others, therefore Love fulfills the requirements of God's law. I mean, how beautiful is that? How perfect is that? My timer's going off. Turn off. Why are you turned on? I hit do not disturb. Right at the end of the message, doesn't it just happen like that? Love fulfills the requirements of God's law. Don't be so focused on perfection. Love people. And when you love people, it's going to get messy, and it's okay. Let's pray together. Lord, we want to say thank you for giving us this new covenant. Thank you for writing your word in our hearts. Thank you for changing us, for saving us. Thank you for giving us new life in Christ. Thank you for the fact that the old is gone and the new has come. Thank you that the Old Testament has pointed us to Jesus. And Jesus, you've changed us and you've pointed us to the Spirit of God. May we continue to strive to live in excellence and holiness, depending on grace, dependent upon mercy, dependent upon love. Lord, help us to love others as we ought to. Use us, O oh God, to make a difference in Lake Havasu, to make a difference in Parker, to make a difference in Arizona. Use us, God, to bring the kingdom of God to people who are hurting. Help us to love others as we ought and help us to live joyfully in the Spirit. Lord, we love you. And we thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.